And welcome back to coverage here of the 2020 season grand finals. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion. Paul, welcome back to the booth. It's always nice to see you. Paul, we're coming into uh, the fifth round here. This is standard. We've got Seth Manfield against Autumn Burchett, but they had a little bit of a glitch to kick things off. So just so that everybody's aware, when we come in here, we're actually coming in, we're joining game one in action, meaning that we're, I don't know, four or five turns in probably by the time we get in. So. It's up to you and I, Paul, to kind of reconstruct what's happened here. It looks like not a whole lot on the battlefield thus far, just Manfield holding on to a, a Vantress Gargoyle and perhaps used a lofty denial on something up there. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks like, um, yeah, I mean, Seth looking in great position here. He's got, wow. a, he's got a, an active Vantress Gargoyle with the Soaring Thought Thief and the ability to cast him into the story just for four mana. Yeah, boy, it does look good from Seth Manfield's seat as we join this match in game number one. Four cards going into hand here for Manfield off of that first copy of End of the Story. Even finds another one with it. Hits a land too, Temple of Deceit. Doesn't want to see another one of those. Is going to go ahead and put it on the bottom before passing the turn back. This is a big turn here for Autumn. They have to get something going like now. Yeah, they need to get off to an extremely quick start. Because if the games do go long, Seth just has the natural advantage because of building into the story, right? If you look at his deck, it's got a lot of cheap interaction, a lot of cheaper removal, Drown of the Lock, Heartless Act, fills up the graveyard, fills up Autumn's graveyard, then all of a sudden you get to restock for four mana, draw four spell. Right. And, you know, Paulo mentioned this when we watched um, Seth play last round, that he thought it was super important about that cheap interaction that you just mentioned, because it's one thing when you can draw a bunch of cards, but they all cost a lot of mana and you can't actually deploy them in time. It's a totally different thing when you can draw a bunch of cards and, and still cast one or two of them in that same turn. Yeah. I mean, just looking at the way that the cards line up, Seth just has a ton of ways to kind of trade up in mana in the matchup. He does have Multi, you know, eight spot removal spells that are instant speed for two mana that allow him to kill whatever larger creatures the auto may have. And and just getting that mana advantage turn over turn is just going to put him, pull him further and further ahead. Seth's got the seven power in the air representing a two turn clock, but Autumn did just cast a scavenging ooze and that could help uh, prolong that clock by p perhaps another turn, depending on how things go here. But Autumn looking to be in a very difficult position here against Seth Manfield in the middle of game number one. Yeah, the one card I wanted to talk about, uh, we don't see it in Autumn's hand, but Seth does need to be mindful of is the card Gem Razor. Autumn has four copies of Gem Razor in their deck, and mm -hmm. Seth is playing four copies of Vantress Gargoyle. So oftentimes you don't want to be playing out that Vantress Gargoyle early, or you could kind of open yourself up to a total blowout to a turn three Gem Razor from Autumn's side. Yeah, it's easy to forget that Vantress Gargoyle is an artifact. Even though it costs blue mana, it still has the, the card type artifact creature and can easily be gem razored out of here. And that is a brutal turn if it happens because not only do you lose your Gargoyle, but you usually get hit by something pretty big that turn as well. Oh, yeah. Well, Seth's going to get in for the, the seven damage in the air here, knocking Autumn down to just six life. And it looks like just going to go ahead and play Salute the Isle rather than cast the Vision with Frantic Inventory, a second copy of End of the Story, as well as Soaring Thought Thief and the Thieves Guild Enforcer. Either Seth's hand or his board or maybe some of each is going to look much, much different than it does now by the time he gets to his draw step. And he gets to keep that information to himself. Autumn, Autumn doesn't get to know what's going on here. Yeah, Autumn can try to get to work here and start exiling cards from their graveyard to make it so that the Ventress Gargoyle won't be able to attack next turn. But mm -hmm. that's a pretty tall order. I mean, at this point, it seems to me that Seth has milled already a good deal of cards here. And... You know, it's hard to tell how many cards Autumn currently has in Graveyard, but Seth does have, of course, that Thieves Guild Enforcer and Soaring Thought Thief that can mill an additional four cards into Autumn's Graveyard. Right, and that's before Seth's turn even. So that is going to be tough for Autumn to be able to churn through enough of those Graveyard cards to actually make the difference. Though, if it was close, then it could be. Could be yeah. a thing. So... 
This is frantic inventory being cast now from Seth. Yeah, this tells me Seth at least has one copy in his graveyard and he wants to make sure he can draw two cards off of it because if Autumn does untap, they can use the scavenging use to remove one of the copies of the frantic, invert frantic inventory and make it such that Seth would only draw one card. Yeah, you're totally right. He drew two cards off of it. Good read there, Paul. Now turn fully back over to Autumn and they've got a 5-5 five, five scavenging news, a bunch of mana available, but are really gonna need to make the, this mana count in order to try to keep from dying next turn. Seth kept up the mana still for that one, two punch that you described with the, uh, the enforcer into the thought thief. Yeah, several options here, Autumn can, the, the important thing here is prior to Autumn attacking, they need to make sure that they do keep up stomp because they do need to be mindful of a potential Thieves Guild enforcer coming into play um, at instant speed, which will have death touch, which would mean mm -hmm. that it would trade with that scavenging use. Is it requisite that Autumn attacks? They don't have to, but we're kind of in a racing situation here. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it might be in their best interest. This is interesting. A Stone Coil Serpent for three does put up a good blocker for the Soaring Thought Thief and could block the Vantress Gargoyle at a pinch. All right, here comes the Scavenging News attack, and unfortunately, there is yeah. no red mana right. available. This is what you were worried about, right, Paul? Yeah, and you can see, I, I think you, you actually got a little bit of a visual, like, after this happened, I think you could already tell that Autumn was not happy with how that was sequenced because, because of this happening right now. Yeah, they're shaking their head right now. And, uh, you know, when you're a player at the level that Autumn is at, that, that isn't the I can't believe you had it head shake. That's the I can't believe I did that head shake. Yeah, for sure. Autumn has proven themselves time and time and again to be, you know, one of the best players in the world. And um, this might have been uh, a minor misstep. Um, this is probably a matchup they didn't test nearly as much as perhaps some of the other decks in the field. Yeah, I mean, you can see the other... The other thought process too, though, right? If the Stone Coil Serpent doesn't resolve, perhaps you don't attack, you know, just in case there is a Thieves Guild Enforcer, which would be lethal. What? Right. I mean, just, you know, putting yeah, yeah, myself yeah. in, in Autumn's seat. Yeah. Now, if that had happened, I think you still might want to put yourself in a racing situation. You could still make a token off the Love Struck Beast. You can still cast Edgewall Innkeeper right. and, and have Trump Locker set in place. But, right. um, and of course, tapping the three, like there's a, a balance there between tapping the red mana and tapping the green mana because leaving up green mana lets you activate scavenging news in additional time. So there's another balance there. These situations are very subtle but tricky and they have big impacts on how the game plays out. As you can see here, the second copy of Soaring Thought Thief, pretty devastating as not, it, it means that if they both attack, then the the serpent, oh, actually the serpent would just get to eat it, wouldn't it? Yeah, it has protection from multicolor. So yeah. if the stone coil serpent resolves, you actually cannot kill it with uh, Drown in the Lock. And mm -hmm. it also gets to freely block a Soaring Thought Thief. So what now? Get in for five, you're down to six. It sets up a lethal attack even through the protection from, from multicolored serpent. And Autumn really has a lot to try to handle here. Yeah. And they decide, I can't, uh, it's too much, you've got lethal, I'm gonna go ahead and pack it in. So game number one goes to Seth Manfield. How many times have I said that in my career? <laughs> uh, it's probably not going to stop, uh, no, let's, I... let's be honest here. Um, I, has there even been a time in the, the past five or six years where we go, you know, Seth, Seth is in a bit of a slump. I don't think so. No, God right? no. Slump? There's, there's no. just a, it, it's actually very similar to 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 actually he was just on the broadcast with Paulo. It seems like you know typically every year he he finds one event to top eight at least, mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the case here with Seth Manfield as well. It's true. Seth is going to consult the sideboard here and see what he'd like to bring in. Um, I, I, I am. But I am loving, he's got four copies of Lowmage's Domi Domination in his sideboard. Oh, yeah, that's sweet. That, that is 
you blue 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 steal a free stone coil serpent oh which that is which, awesome. which is which is pretty incredible um yeah and it seems like an amazing card in this matchup now it's not quite as good against maybe the adventures decks that are playing cards like racing borrower but here it is fantastic autumn is known for their love of gruel uh in general, like as a as a lifestyle choice, but also <laughs> uh, playing the actual cards. And Autumn has Gruel Adventures. At least that's the kind of shorthand name uh, for for the deck. Even though it's not really an adventure themed deck, particularly, right? Yeah, it's it's mostly a Gruel, somewhat aggro, somewhat mid range deck, right? It just got really really heavy hitting creatures and tries to close out the game with a well timed Embercleave. The problem mm -hmm. is this is probably one of the worst matchups to play a card like Embercleave because Seth Manfield has eight effectively Doom Blades in his deck, eight two mana instants that can just kill a creature at instant speed. So uh, while Embercleave is one of the most powerful cards in standard, I just feel like in this specific matchup, it's it's not quite as good. Also worth noting here, Paul, um, I didn't mention it at the top, but these are our two undefeated players, uh, four and oh for each of them. So one of them will emerge. As our, as our last undefeated after this match. Currently, looking like Seth, being up a game. Yeah. Now, Seth did mention in the winner interview in the last round that he was concerned about specifically the card Chainweb Arachnir. And Autumn mm. is playing three copies of that in the sideboard, which is extremely powerful here because the whole point of Seth's deck is to try to mill you and put eight cards into your graveyard. And if you do, and if you have that many spiders in your graveyard, really good shot that eventually you're going to mill one, which will provide Autumn basically a free resource in their graveyard, which is going to be basically a free way to deal with Soaring Thought Thieves and potentially Vantress Gargoyles. However, I would have, I would guess that Seth probably cyborgs out some number of Vantress Gargoyle due to the existence of Gem Razor in Autumn's deck. Right, that makes a lot of sense. It's tough because uh, the Gargoyle does seem to hold a pretty critical position for Seth as an enabler of a lot of his other cards and then also a potential win condition. That said, Seth's deck can become more controlling than it is at face value if he'd like it to. And he may have gone in that direction here. Here's Kazandu Mammoth. This thing gets very hard, too. It's answerable. You know, this isn't the type of card that, that has any way to really protect itself. But if Seth doesn't have an answer, the, the damage piles up very, very quickly. So he's going to use Lofty Denial to nab that Mammoth. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the Mammoth is, is one of my favorite cards in the new set. And unfortunately, kind of the way the meta has broken down, it hasn't seen a ton of play. So it's pretty exciting to see Autumn and their team actually choosing to play with the powerful creature. Yeah. Or the powerful land, depending on how you see it. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that's why it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Edgewall Innkeeper on the stack now for Burchett. Manfield says, sure. But here comes Bone Crusher Giant with the trigger from the Innkeeper. So this worked out well for Autumn. Five power on the board now, over two separate creatures and a card in hand. Here's Saloon Division now for Manfield. He gets to look at the top six and he can take an instant or sorcery from among them and put it in hand. He's gonna take into the story. Now, currently that's a long-term game plan that he's not actually dealing with just yet. It costs seven mana right now. So that's something for down the line. Yeah. I imagine Seth is probably going to use that Blood Chief's Thirst to get that Edgewell Innkeeper off the battlefield, but he actually really doesn't have a whole lot going outside of that here. Um, he's pretty far away from getting eight cards in Autumn's Graveyard. Oh, wow, and, and actually just trying to stem the bleeding here and going for the Giant instead. Wow, yeah, must have been more worried about life total, figuring if I can get to into the story stage, I may be able to take over this game. But boy, leaving an Edgewall Innkeeper on the battlefield is uh, not where you want to be either against this deck. As it stands, Vivian Monsters Advocate's going to hit the battlefield and immediately create a 3-3. And, and also, keep in mind, Seth isn't playing the full-on adventurous package that you would expect from typical Gruul decks. He's not playing Grimrock Knight. I believe there are only eight adventure creatures in Autumn's list. So, mm. so given that, I mean, there's just a far less likelihood that you actually get punished for keeping the Edgewall Innkeeper alive, given that Autumn's already played one of their eight adventure creatures. Oh, sure. Right. This, this is not the full package. That makes sense. Interesting. 
still scary, right? Like if you're oh, yeah. there. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Okay, so now where are we going? There's a Thieves Guild Enforcer and a Soaring Thought Thief, which that's interesting, right? That represents quite a few cards going to the graveyard over on Autumn's side and perhaps getting that into the story turned on. Otherwise, it's Luris being put into hand, though Seth is going to be patient and just pass here. Yeah, but Seth is in some trouble here. I mean, resolve the Planeswalker against the control deck with, and, and you got to untap and get another activation here. Oh, and this is nice too. Autumn is going to be able to shuffle and get to see what else is on top of their deck to see if they can play some free creatures here off of Vivian, Monster's Advocate. Oh, very nice. Ooh, and they hit. And they hit. Look at that. It's a Stone Coil Serpent. Seth, all out of answers at this point. Just the two creatures in the end of the story. And Autumn just deciding how they want to sequence this turn. Do they want to attack first? If, for example, Seth somehow plays enough spells to get a, a Death Touch Thief Guild's Enforcer, do you want to stomp it? My guess is Seth probably is just going to go for uh, the taking three damage here. I, I don't think Autumn has enough cards in their graveyard currently. His hand looks very nice for Autumn with the Bone Crusher Giant and even a Ranger's Guile. Now Seth is going to go for Soaring Thought Thief here as well. Is this going to put the eighth card into the graveyard? Given that he's flashing it in, it seems to me that that's the case. Right, and but Autumn cleverly here is going to use Bone Crusher Giant in response, and that means no cards are going to go to the graveyard on Autumn's side, not even the Giant. Yeah, this is looking really good for Autumn. Very now well they're... timed there, yeah. And there's your favorite, the Kazandu Mammoth hits the <laughs> battlefield too, and this board is getting very scary very quickly if you're sitting in Seth Manfield's side, especially when you look at Seth's hand and see so just land and into the story and into the story still full price right now. Yeah, and keep in mind, Vivian can also just pump out an army of 3-3 reach creatures. So the Sony right. Thought Thief won't even be able to get in there. Totally. Every day is a new mutation. That one has reach. Yeah, and Autumn had the option of running out the Arachnir, but with that, wanted to keep up the Ranger's Guile. Wow, great win there for Autumn. They're going to pick up game number two and even things up against Seth. And it really never felt like Autumn lost their hold on that game. Every play crisp and the the library was kind and everything just really kind of came together there for Autumn. Yeah, that Vivian did a lot of work. And the important thing for Seth's deck to function is to just make sure that he has enough ways to interact early to be able to fill up Autumn's graveyard. And he wasn't able to. So that into the story that he had in his hand just wasn't able to do anything. All right, back to the sideboard plan again. And Seth, with what all ended up being a clunky draw, well met by Autumn, but also clunky even on Seth's side of the battlefield. I think he's going to hope for something a little more interactive than what he had there. Yeah. But no, this time around, Seth is on the play, which is which is huge. Uh, that that allows him to turn on and and utilize some of his cheap counter spells too. If he had, if he depending on how many of those he decided to keep in, cards like Lofty Denial are far better on the play. Yeah, huge. Those are massive. All right, game three to decide who's going to be the last undefeated player here in the uh, first day of our 2020 season grand finals. If you're just tuning in, we're in the standard portion. We played some historic for the first few rounds of the day, and now we're kind of winding things down this round and then another to go with uh, with standard. And as you, uh, if, if you have literally just tuned in, you're watching Autumn Burchett versus Seth Manfield each tied at a game apiece to see who's going to be undefeated. Oh, is that a... No, it's just the mobile six. Okay. 
Autumn's on six? I believe so. I did see something like that out there too. I think they may be deciding which card to put back. Yeah, much better hand here for Seth. He's got basically the first three to four turns covered at this point. Being able to sequence out his lands, uh, use an eliminate for a cheap creature, then run out Thieves Guild Enforcer into Drown in the Lock for uh, answers for the next two turns. Game over? Not game over, but it's a great start. Great start. Yeah, great start. agreed. Eliminate a fine little backup plan as well. And you see kind of an interesting opener here for Autumn. All the tools are there. Edgewall, Innkeeper, Stone Cold Serpent, Bone Crusher, Giant. So a little bit of interaction, a little bit of good stuff going. And then the Great Henge is hanging out in hand here for Autumn. Looks pretty useless at the moment, but could be a factor. Oh, and there's an Ember Cleave. So some two very powerful late game cards here for for Autumn Burchett, but we're nowhere near that just on turn two here. Yeah, if Autumn manages to find a way to resolve the Great Henge, which is going to be really difficult in its own right, because Seth is going to do a good job of keeping the battlefield clear of creatures. But if Autumn does do a good job of keeping, uh, of, of resolving the Great Henge, the blue-black color combination just has a very difficult time dealing with artifacts in general. We were talking earlier about how tough it is to deal with something like a Lucky Clover. I mean, uh, the Great Henge kind of falls in a similar place, but of course there's a few more interaction points because, well, it's gonna cost nine mana. Right. And the card that he drew, I mean, that was the perfect card here. That Into the Story was huge because now, that has kind of that late game strategy all set in place. He's got the ways to interact early, and then he's got the card that basically will allow him to uh, fill his hand back up. Yeah, really perfect stuff here for Manfield thus far. And I, I'm game, sure this <laughs> is there, right? It's all sitting in front of you if you're Seth. Yeah, and I'm sure this is, you know, every... every everybody who plays against a control deck's nightmare. You're like, okay, well, which one are you going to counter? I know you're going to counter something. All right, which one are you going to kill? I just have to make sure I sequence this properly so I can get maximum value. And that's what Autumn's doing. They're playing it very patiently here. I imagine that next turn they're going to do something like run out Edgewall and Keeper, then play the Bone Crusher Giant to make sure that they're at least going to get the card back for one turn before Seth has an opportunity to, to interact in some way. Yeah, I got to say this hand from Seth is just a dream. Like triple drown in the lock that that is i mean that is the card right like seriously that you know especially with the way that seth has this deck built that's the card that gives you answers to basically everything and he has three of them evolving wilds is going to be the first card in the graveyard for burchette but as you see the thieves guild enforcer is going to help add to that and then it'll start to snowball from there if seth can find any other way to uh to get a few cards into the yard. And of course, don't forget, they also just end up in the yard as well. So there's yeah. a Bone Crusher Giant upstairs for Autumn on end step. Seth with a tough decision there, ultimately decided to pay the companion cost for Luris rather than leave up anything other than a Thieves Guild Enforcer available. I guess Seth isn't really too afraid of anything that Autumn can do this turn. And instead chose to, and thought maybe this was the best opportunity to get the Luris in hand. Given the fact that Seth can still play Thieves Guild Enforcer and next turn still find two removal spells, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's probably why he decided to go for the Lyris this turn. Well, he got punished a little bit. It was Edgewall Innkeeper into Bone Crusher Giant, so five power out once again and an extra card in hand for Burchett. Seth definitely interested in hitting those land drops going forward as the... Uh, into the story is going to be a big issue. So here we go. Eliminate to take out the Edgewall Innkeeper, but that does leave a Bone Crusher Giant left over. Is Seth going to try to play around the Great Henge here? Because if the Great Henge gets cast here, that's a he, lot of trouble here for Seth. I don't, he can't Seth actually can't counter, counter it. Yeah, right? he cannot counter it. So this is the window, and now Autumn has to decide, do I want to play around Lofty Denial? I'm not sure. But the thing is, the longer the game goes on, the more cards that are going to go into my graveyard, all of a sudden you turn on Drown in the Lock. So this might be the best time to just go for the Great Hedge. And Autumn's going for it. Great Hedge on the stack. Oh, <laughs> I spoke too soon. It. There it is. Oh, there Great Hedge on the stack. And Seth Manfield says, oh, I thought I had answers for pretty much everything, but I don't. 
And oh. remember, Seth doesn't have any way to deal with the Great Hinge in his deck. Like, he needs to counter it on the way down, which he can actually do with Drown in the Lock late in the game, but not at this point. And he is going to have to face down the Great Henge, and Autumn is absolutely stoked about that. A big smile from Autumn. Yeah, so now, I mean, Seth does have three copies of Drown in the Lock, so he can counter the next three creature spells, right? Mm -hmm. And so the creatures will never enter, will not actually enter the battlefield. That's how you get the, the card draw trigger. So, I mean, that's probably going to be his game plan. Counter the next three spells, draw some cards with into the story. So still looking... Okay, but the longer the game goes, of course, at some point, something will probably stick with that Great Avenger that we play. And this is just taking your medicine here, too. He's going to use Drown in the Lock on the Bone Crusher Giant, after all, where if he would have done this on, say, upkeep or on his own turn, then the Great Henge would be stranded in hand. But uh, he chose to keep that window open, and Burchett jumped right through it and now has the Great Henge going. Yeah, and now Bridget's going to be able to put some pressure on the battlefield, and still, and the cards will place themselves. Seth does not have the mana here to co uh, to kill to counter anything with Drown in the Lock. Yeah, so the he only can go, mm -hmm. so he can go Edgewall Innkeeper, e even maybe just play a Stone Coil Serpent. I mean, just have some creatures on the battlefield because Seth's whole deck is just trying to one for one you anyways. That's right, and there we go, Stone Coil Serpent comes down as a three three. It's actually a two two, and then it gets an additional counter from the Henge, but. Most importantly, card in hand for Burchett to try to fight card for card here. Because, you know, when you think of a Gruel Adventures or a, a Gruel Ember Cleave deck, you're not really thinking that it has the ability to fight on a card advantage angle. But this deck actually can if it has great henge out. Yeah. Boy, Seth is in a tricky position now. And I'll remind you, if you are just tuning in and you haven't seen Seth play this deck yet, yeah, it says Demir Rogues, and he is playing some Rogues. You see one on the battlefield here. But it's not the dedicated Rogues list. When I said he didn't have an answer for cards like the Great Henge, he really doesn't. He, he doesn't even have, um, like, Borrower or anything like that to be able to uh, bounce it to hand and counter it on the way back. Yeah, I mean, look at what's happening here. Seth is going to be able to counter one of these creatures, right? Mm -hmm. And... I mean, at this point, he probably doesn't want the game to kind of get out of hand, so maybe he wants to prevent all the card draw here. But, I mean, Autumn doesn't really care about any of these creatures. They just want one of them to resolve, to just kind of get that card advantage engine going here off that great hedge. Yeah, that's the luxury that they have now after having resolved. Took the risk on not playing around Lofty Denial. It was correct. It looked like to go for it, and it proved to be correct in this situation as well. And now they can just throw out brush fire elemental, like, hey, I don't know, do something about it, right? And it, <laughs> yeah. you know, that's fine. It, 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 like you said, Autumn is the one who has the luxury here of not having to care. They can just start throwing these creatures out over and over. So brush fire is going to pick up the plus two plus two until end of turn. It also gets a plus one plus one counter, and this is an attack for seven. Yeah. And that Lurus can't even block the Stone Coil Serpent. Nope. And uh, Seth is blocking here with the Thieves Guild Enforcer to prevent to one damage. Lurus. Yeah, yeah, because he'll be able to use the Lurus next turn. Right, but but as you mentioned, the Stone Coil Serpent with Trample, it, it's only soaking up a single point of damage, so he's just trying to get value. If Autumn leads with Edgewall Innkeeper, and because it's a pretty scary threat, if Seth does counter with Drown in the Lock, Autumn can position themselves to then resolve a Vivian here, too. Now, I'm just going to go for Kazandu Mammoth first. Feels like you might want to counter here. Like, what else can Autumn play this turn that's going to be that much better than the Kazandu Mammoth at this point? They have three mana right. available, so it's going to right. be something kind of in the similar vein. And at the same time, you don't want them to draw cards. Yeah, and, you know, Seth also is trying to manage Autumn's graveyard. Seth is trying to get up to that seven cards in yards so that the end of the story can actually be cast for four mana. And that could be another reason to, to chump block there with the Enforcer. That'll get a couple of cards in. And then Drown and Lock, anything, will get another card in the, in the yard. But Autumn led with the card that she perhaps, excuse me, that they probably didn't need as we see Edgewell Innkeeper now hit the battlefield and represent even more. Oh, and look oh, at that. Man. 
bad. Boy, <laughs> not enough. <laughs> Autumn's like, how Jeez. sweet it is. This what? great Henge doing some Still serious works. work in this matchup. Wow, incredible. What a draw. And this heartless act can't do anything. All the no. creatures have counters on them because of the Great Hedge. It can do something, Paul. It can remove a cow. Oh, my bad. My bad. I forgot it has another line of text on it. You are correct. No, oh, it man. can actually kill the Stone Coil Serpent. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah, I guess yes. so. But even then, I mean, my goodness <laughs> sakes, this has really gotten out of control. Ever since the Great Hedge hit for Autumn, they've been able to just dominate here. And uh, that's it, right? I mean, that, Autumn can Ember Cleave next turn. Yes. Autumn has two sources of red, and they can just ember cleave it up. Blood so that's chiefs. Eight, that's eight damage. I mm -hmm. guess that would be eight damage. Okay, so maybe another turn here. Really, as long as you keep seeing creatures go into the hand of Autumn, <laughs> right? They are going to be able to take advantage of the Great Henge and just never run out of gas. Yeah, this is this is just too much. Back to nature. We're going to have a problem. Seth Manfield left the door open for the Great Henge and has been well and truly punished here as uh, as Autumn moves closer to a victory. And, you know, honestly, th this could, this is one of the, the, the benefits of playing a deck that's a little bit off the radar, right? When mm -hmm. you play a deck that maybe you're not as used to playing against, all of a sudden there are cards that they play that used to be amazing threats, but maybe you forget about them or, 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 you know, the, the, like the thing is, I mean, I want to, I'm always going to give Seth the benefit of the doubt. He's the best, he's, he's probably the best player in the world. Right. Uh, and Seth, Seth, by the way, tapped blue too many here. So can't cast Lola mages. Right. As I say now. that the thing that I just said, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, he, just, uh... <laughs> he threw you under the bus a little on that one. And also he's going to scoop him up. Autumn Burchett is going to pick up the victory and we have one undefeated player left in the field, and that player is Autumn Burchett for the United Kingdom. So really excellent stuff there. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it uh, for, for this one. Let's head over to day nine. There is only one 5-0 and oh in the virtual building, and they are joining me here right now. It's Autumn Burchett. Welcome, Autumn. Hey, great to be here. So you are doing Gruel Adventures and you played up against Seth Manfield's Demir Rogues in the last round. That had to have been a match that you were unlikely to have prepared for given how unique the list was. How'd you navigate through that match? Uh, so I think normal Demir Rogues is like basically the worst possible matchup. Um, <laughs> we put the third Arachnia in the sideboard at last minute, just in case. Mm -hmm. uh, this list is a bit weird. I think it's like more controlling and a bit slower. Um, I I think yeah, yeah. pre-board is just like very tough, but post-board I get to bring in my Arachnids, which didn't come up, but I also get Vivian and Great Henge, both of which are just so hard to oh, deal yeah. with, especially for Seth's build. Uh, the normal rogue list, if you get down a Vivian, sometimes she takes over the game and makes a wall of reach creatures, but sometimes yeah. like they have a couple flyers and she dies after a turn, whereas against <laughs> Seth's <laughs> list... He's just, he just really struggles to kill a Vivian, especially I, I was assuming he was boarding out the Gargoyle because it's so bad against Gem Razor. If he's like boarding out that too, it's just you have so few things that can attack her down. So. Yeah, and I'm, I kind of want to zoom in on that Gem Razor and this list in general. Omnath is the name of the game, particularly Adventures Omnath. Why did you pick this list? Remember Emma Handis, excuse me, Emma Handy saying that at the last second, she identified this as a potentially strong build. Yeah, um, so I wasn't super happy with either Omnath deck and yeah. wanted, and like, basically at the last, last like, night before deck lists were due, the, the 11th hour or whatever was the like last resigned. Second, of course. To, <laughs> yeah, was resigned to registering uh, Omnath ramp and hoping people, like, there were lots of adventures lists, which as it happened would have worked out well. But yeah. Um and then Ever and I are both in the same spot where we're like neither of us are happy like about the situation. And we scour the the matchup percentages from the previous weekend's events once more. And we notice that like 
Gruel Adventures, its overall win percentage was like fine, but its win percentage Not, against yeah. Ramp and Adventures, those two decks were so good. And it was just struggling ah. against the random nonsense. Well, so. you've done well with it so far. And I want to ask one last brief question. Are you more eager to play more standard, as is the case in the next full round, or are you looking to go back to historic? I worked on my historic list for like a week. Uh, I did the majority of the historic testing and like mm -hmm. kind of let everyone else just focus on standard for the most part. So I'm super comfortable playing that list. It's great fun to you. Well, that's great because Historic will be returning on day two in the final three rounds. Congratulations again, Autumn Burchett, on being 5-0. and And of course, let's head back to the casters for more magic action. A great win and a great start there for Autumn Burchett off to that perfect 5-0. And sometimes we do see that in these smaller field tournaments where one player will kind of run away with it and really open up the middle. We'll have to keep an eye on that story as it develops. For now, though, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more from round five here from the 2020 season grand finals. Don't go anywhere. My name's Emma Handy. I'm 28 years old and I'm from the United States. My name's Piotr Bogowski. I'm 25 years old. I'm from Poland. And welcome back to coverage here of the 2020 season grand finals. Marshall Cycliff with Paul Chion. Paul, we've got Emma Handy versus Piotr Bogowski here. These two players actually tested um, on a, they, they formed a little testing team, the, them two, and who else was it? Autumn and somebody else. Autumn and, and Luis Salvato. And Luis Salvato. Uh, but interestingly, you'll note here that they're not actually playing the same list as each other here in standard. Yeah, I think uh, Piotr Glagowski is still a believer in the power of Omneth, and mm. chose to, <laughs> which I uh, can't blame him, but uh, chose to submit Omneth ramp in uh, both standard and historic. Of course, things working out very well for him so far. Um, but of course, Emma is playing the deck that the rest of their team chose to play in Gruel Adventures. Yeah, this is the, the deck that we just saw this very round. Their teammate, Autumn Burchett, improved 5-0 and here in the tournament. And we'll see how it does against Piotr's Omnath ramp list. Just couldn't quite convince Piotr to go with beatdown, it looks like. <laughs> 
Yeah, curious to see how the rest of their team doing because Autumn pulled out a fairly impressive victory against Manfield just earlier. Oh, it looks like we're actually coming in in game number two here, Paul, uh, with Emma Handy having picked up the first game. Oh, yeah, all right. I did not notice that straight away. So there we go. Yeah, one interesting note here is I think Emma is much happier to play against this version of um, of Omnath Ramp. We have, of course, Omnath Adventures on the Omnath Ramp because the the ramp decks play far less um, interaction, right? It's playing right. zero brazen borrowers. There are there are no there are no giant killers. There's there's nothing of that sort because it's just trying to go over the top. Meaning because it doesn't have those instant speed sources of interaction, Emma can pretty easily rely on having Embercleave close out the game for her. Right, even even if Glagowski gets a pretty good turn, he may still just lose the next turn anyway because of the power of Embercleave. Now, if Glagowski does the full, you know, yeah, Feldar retreat, Clo Cobra, all the nonsense, then then of course he will be able to either, either win that turn or have enough power and toughness on the battlefield to not die. But, uh, but yeah, Emma still has the ability to, to win a game that, that looks unwinnable, thanks to Ember Queen. Yeah, and, and Felidar Retreat is the reason why you see Emma still has some number of gem raiser after sideboard in this matchup. Mm, okay. She may get a target for it here, as we see Lotus Cobra into fetch land, and now Felidar Retreat on the battlefield, and <laughs> Emma's got to be liking what she's seeing here. Yeah, this is going to be big. Emma can... Emma can mutate the gem razor and use primal might here to get that lotus cobra off the battlefield right people always forget primal might has the kind of prey upon mode where it just fights yeah and it is actually better to primal might first attack and then gem razor if you do want to get rid of the retreat because you are actually it doesn't matter right you can you can put it above or beneath the mind. right yeah Probably putting it under. Right. Generally speaking, you'll want to uh, love start piece is just bigger, which is yeah. rare for gem razor. Oftentimes, gem razor goes on something smaller. Oof! And um, Piotr really need a land number five here. Look at his hand; it's just oh. chock full of five drops here. Boy, that was tough. The best thing he can do here is hope that Emma doesn't run out that edge wall innkeeper pre combat, and then he can use stomp to kill the human and keep the beast back, I suppose. Yeah, so Emma should definitely play Edgewall Innkeeper to play around that. Right. And she does. Oh, she's just going to run out Bone Crusher Giant 2 and get a card right now. Thank you oh, very yeah. much. Yeah, Piotr's, Piotr's going to take six here, probably killing the Edgewall Innkeeper. But I mean, even if he draws a land here, like what, you know, yeah. I, I suppose he can run out Tenrith. And try to trade with the beast. Yeah, but oh, that's but it. it was wow. Faladar retreat off the top. And that was that. Emma Handy picks up the win here, two games to zero. And it looked easy. I, I mean, I gotta say, a stumble there from Pyotr Gogowski was maximally punished there, Paul. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to be here for this round for this uh, top notch. Uh, uh, Top-notch commentary here as an expert because uh, hey, yeah, you could have just come in really... and said "gruel smash." I would have been like, uh -huh. <laughs> "gruel smash, gruel smash." That basically <laughs> sums up the round quite nicely for what we saw on camera. Looks like that gruel deck may have some legs under it. We'll see how it does going forward in the tournament. For now, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, though, we'll have the last round from day one here at the 2020 season grand finals. Don't go anywhere.